you so much for that introduction. And um, thank you very much to the IIEA for uh, inviting me uh, here today. Uh, it's a great um, pleasure to be in Dublin. I have to admit, I was uh, living in uh, the United States, in New York, for seven years. And uh, what with one thing and another, the last time I actually came to Dublin was a decade ago. And I remember it was a time when the, uh, the Celtic tiger was roaring. There was very strong economic growth. There was a healthy housing market. Uh, and there was a lot of a sense of sort of enterprise and hope among young people. And coming back today, I noticed that nothing has changed. Uh, did I miss anything? Um, I'd like to, um, to start by telling a couple of stories just about my uh, recent travels uh, to, uh, to Europe, specifically to France. And the first is that the other day I went, um, I went to uh, Cannes, in south of France, for a, uh, for a conference. And on the way back, I was flying, flying EasyJet. And I'd forgotten to print out my boarding pass, and I went into the terminal in Cannes. And there was a very long line and one person serving. And I went to the, uh, the ticketing desk, said to the uh, lady behind the counter, I don't have my boarding pass, but I don't have any luggage. I just want to print out my boarding pass. She said, sir, you have to stand in that line. And I said, well, don't you have a machine where I can just print out my boarding pass? She said, no, sir. She said, we do not have a machine. It would be bad for jobs. You have to stand in the line. So I felt like saying, although I did not say, you're the country with 11% unemployment. We're the country with 6.5% unemployment. But instead, I stood in the line um, for 40 minutes. My second story which is slightly more pro-French, is that uh, actually at the weekend I was, uh, went to Paris with my wife for her birthday, and while I was on the Eurostar, I was reading, it came up on, on my uh, uh, phone, uh, the, the disastrous interview given by the uh, head of John Lewis, uh, Andy Street, about what he thought about the French and the French economy, based mainly on how bad God, the Garde du Nord was. And I think he described it as a sort of terrible, one of the worst stations he'd ever seen, said that he regarded the French economy as finished and that people should pull out their investment immediately. And given that he'd been invited to France to be given an award, it seemed extremely rude. And indeed, uh, earlier this week, the French prime minister said he must have been drunk. Uh, but uh, as I was going to the Garde du Nord at the time, it didn't make me uh, look around with particular interest. And yes, the Garde du Nord is not a particularly pleasant station. Um, however, the thing that actually struck me was spending the weekend in Paris, particularly on the eastern side of Paris, going to restaurants there, shops, talking to people, is actually a generation of people, who, uh, of younger people, who are exceedingly well-traveled, speak English very well, have a very open-minded and entrepreneurial attitude. And I was really rather impressed by the energy there, similar to the energy you would see uh, in Shoreditch, where I live in London, New York, Dublin. Um, and so it seems to me that when we think about um, the European economy, regulation, what we want out of uh, the creative economies and technology, we should think about that generation and their expectations and their attitudes and their opportunities, rather than always thinking about the past and a generation that, that is in charge at the moment. And, and this is a particularly timely topic at the moment, regulation and Europe, and it's a particularly timely place to talk about it in. Uh, we've seen a set of changes and incidents um, that I think have subtly changed and sometimes quite crudely changed attitudes within Europe, particularly within the uh, Eurozone, towards large technology companies, particularly uh, American technology companies. Um, the first sort of set of squabbles, I think, was over copyright, the copyright wars, particularly media owners, newspaper owners, feeling that Google and other internet-based companies, Facebook, were not respecting copyright and were undermining um, <coughs> the, their own industries. The second, I think, when we saw uh, last year, the revelations about the NSA and Google, uh, and sorry, the NSA and spying and uh, picking up messages uh, from the internet 
uh, and having the ability to see what emails you were sending, uh, where you were, even listen to your, uh, your voice messages. And a sense that the NSA was in some sense in, uh, unwilling on the part of the uh, large US internet companies, but an alliance where they would scoop information out of these big information repositories, particularly uh, the US companies, and that it was that European indiv uh, individuals, European citizens, had really no choice and were uh, under threat from this power. Uh, the third incident recently is the European Court of Human Rights ruling on the droit d'oublier, the right to be forgotten, uh, where an unexpected ruling actually that uh, Google had to uh, censor its results in Europe and take out certain uh, search listings when individuals complained that it was an invasion of their privacy. And then finally, and pertinently to Dublin, the recent debate about tax avoidance by large uh, companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, as well as others, uh, and a sense that these large internet giants were coming here, providing some employment, certainly, but uh, participating in a large consumer market without paying their fair share of tax. Uh, and behind all of these things, uh, there's a growing sense, I think, of uh, a fear about U.S. dominance. Two attitudes, actually, together, both fear and envy, a feeling that we are, that within the European economy, that the, the U.S. companies are dominant, at the same time an envy of what the U.S. has produced in terms of innovation, technology, an envy of Silicon Valley and what it's done for the U.S. economy. Uh, and so those two attitudes... Uh, to be held together. Now, I'm sure many of you here have been to Southern California, have, uh, sorry, Northern California, have been to Silicon Valley, and the, the, the sense one has just being there in Palo Alto or Mountain View, not only that this is a place where a lot of people do things or enterprising, create new companies, but I find a sense that, that, you, that one feels, if I were here, I'd go out and found a company, I'd go and do something, because there just seems to be something in the water or in the air that, that encourages risk-taking. And I would, uh, I would um, say there were three things there. One is an attitude. And I think, you know, the cliched American attitude of optimism, risk-taking, willingness to throw things up in the air, uh, willingness to take a chance... In, uh, in search of a better future and in, in search for a reward. Second, infrastructure. By infrastructure, I'm talking broadly. I'm, say, I'm talking about Stanford University, a highly educated uh, workforce, a research base that forms the, has formed historically the basis of many Silicon Valley startups and Silicon Valley companies. Uh, Sand Hill Road, the home of venture capital, the fact that if you have an idea which seems like it might work, there's a ready base of financing for it if people can see a profit in it, if these companies, which again have a history of achieving really rather high returns from a few enormous successes, uh, think that you might be the next big thing. Uh, and then finally, regulation. Uh, and by regulation, I mean... Uh, a sense that you're not going to be regulated out of existence, that if you start a company which is disruptive, it won't be blocked from doing something, uh, that a venture capital company that invests in that company, even if, it, even if it has large disruptive effects, will be able to get large returns from it. And generally speaking, those things come together, I think, to create an atmosphere of energy uh, and risk-taking. Um, and, of course, the, uh, the favourite word of uh, Silicon Valley these days, there's conferences named after it, people talk about it all the time, is disruption. Uh, and disruption is a rather nice sort of word because it suggests that you're shaking things up in a positive sort of way. But, of course, what it really means in some ways is destruction. You're talking about setting up a company a small company that will destroy part of the business of a large company. That's why it's <coughs> going to make a lot of money, and that is why venture capitalists want to invest in it. 
Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian um, economist, and actually f briefly its finance minister, uh, was uh, European. Uh, but uh, he expressed it very well in this phrase of creative destruction and the nature of capitalism being creative destruction, a constant ferment of things rising and things being pulled down, of companies rising and collapsing, and he compared that with socialism. Now, and I think there's a sort of broad sense, not, in the, not only in the US, but even within Europe itself, that the US is much more comfortable with the idea of creative destruction than, than many European citizens are. Um, this is not to say, by the way, that, um, that there is no such thing as regulation in the US. Uh, believe me, if you've ever lived in New York, you will know there's an awful lot of regulation and really quite detailed regulation from not being able to jaywalk to all sorts of rules. Uh, it doesn't, sometimes when you're there, uh, the image of the US as being a light regulation society certainly doesn't feel like it. And a lot of US regulation is not only quite detailed, but highly politicized. It is a democratic system where often a financial regulator will be an elected official and will be trying to make a name for himself or herself by imposing new rules. Um, and there is the whole web of both federal and state regulation. And you can often end up in different industries, particularly the finance industry, with four or five different regulators um, taking interest in your affairs. Equally, I don't think that the cliche that uh, European regulation is, is, is bad, heavy-handed, and protectionist is, is true either. There's actually been quite a lot of quite smart EU regulation in the area of telecoms, uh, technology, and media over the years. I think of the creation within the EU of the GSM standard, which was one of, which was one of the reasons why the, uh, Europe was actually ahead of the US in uh, the early, earlier development of mobile phones. I think of uh, local loop unbundling in uh, telecoms, where state uh, companies were forced to let their networks be used by competitors, much more effectively, by the way, than in the US, where the Federal Communications Commission attempted a similar thing and then backed down from it, as a result of which there is a cable telecoms duopoly in a lot of places. If you're in New York, you have a choice of uh, Time Warner, and I speak from experience, Time Warner Cable um, <coughs> uh, or a Verizon, and that's about it. Uh, you have a much greater choice of services in, in Dublin or, or London. And behind that, I think, the, the EU competition push to, to limit the power of, of state companies and former state-owned companies is quite important. And a lot of the EU regulation, um, at least some of it, is, is much more technocratic and economically rational and I, I don't mean that as an entirely as a value judgment. I mean it's, it takes a strict economic view rather than a political view of what is best. Um, and equally, I would say that we're seeing moves in the new European Commission that understand the importance of small business investment, of infrastructure, of energy and broadband investment. And I think that they, there's the EU Jobs and Investment Programme, which is due out in, uh, due to be published in February if this uh, EU Commission is actually allowed to start working, um, that these are quite hopeful, uh, sensible initiatives. But I also think that uh, there is a danger at the moment at this particular turning point of, of European attitudes to technology. And the danger, I think, is exemplified in the uh, letter, open letter written by Matthias Dofner of Axel Springer, an open letter to Google, which I think, if those of you who haven't read it, is very much worth reading, because it's a sort of long cry of pain about various aspects of privacy, of uh, media content, of copyright, of whether or not Google will allow uh, search engines owned by Axel Springer, not coincidentally, uh, to have high rankings on its search pages and a sort of general, all-encompassing sense that Google is a, an over-dominant bad thing that needs to be reined in on any number of grounds. Um, and I think one has to 
examine that sort of thing pretty carefully. It's not that he doesn't identify real concerns, but it seems to me that there is a, and, and one can also see it in the lobbying campaign against, which is attempting to get Google's competition case, uh, sorry, the Competition Commission in the EU to limit Google's power and to affect and to change its search rankings. If you look at the lobbying, uh, and the complaints against Google, they come from all sorts of different industries with very different interests from search engines to content companies. And one, one is left with a broad impression that they were simply like a lot of smaller European companies not to face such tough competition from a large US one. And behind that, there is a sense that Europe is a place of a strong creative industry but based more on media content, from print to audiovisual uh, to video games, uh, than it is to do with software, software and services and technology. And I understand that fear. My brother-in-law works for the Neue uh, Zeitung, uh, the, the Swiss paper, um, which is just currently going through tremendous upheavals. Uh, and the real questions about whether or not it can survive. And the NZZ, rather like the Times of London, maybe the Irish Times, is absolutely part of a fab the fabric of Swiss society. So these are real, uh, it's causing real pain. Uh, if you look at the figures, um, there's a recent study by Bertelsmann of the Euro what he calls the European creative economy. And um, indeed, you know, this is a, a large contributor to many uh, European countries, uh, evaluated of, it estimates, 40 billion, 48 billion euros in, uh, in Germany, 34 billion euros in France. The composition, if you look at it, in, in Germany, 20 billion of its uh, GDP, annual GDP, is from print, 10, 10 billion from audiovisual. The UK is actually balanced rather differently. Um, it's in, in its definition of what is uh, the creative industry, uh, it, 560,000 jobs are in software and IT, which is a third of the total. Uh, so it's a third of the total, and the rest of the pie is, are things like print, audiovisual, uh, music, and so forth, content, as we would call it. And of course, uh, the UK is very far from uh, uh, the sole case. A lot of the, some of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, um, are particularly uh, innovative and have a strong technology base. But generally speaking, when the, the EU agenda for, uh, for technology uh, talks of a slow uptake of ICT and how that affects not only uh, the, the ICT industry itself, but more broadly productivity in across a, a range of industries. And indeed, the EU itself points to the research and development in ICT being at 37 billion uh, in the European Union. This is 2007 figures and 88 billion in the US. So something feels as though it might go wrong here if we start... Uh, simply trying to protect what we have. I think that there's, there's a rather obvious flaw, and it's a symbol more than anything else, in the right to be forgotten ruling, where the court decided that uh, Google had to, uh, Google and other search engines, but Google has, I think, 90% market share in, uh, in the EU, compared actually with a much lower market share, 68% in the US. But the court decided that, he, that Google would have to remove uh, search uh, references to underlying content. Now, it did not say that if you had a story, if there was a story published about you or a Facebook entry, uh, and that the actual content owner had to take the story away. It said that Google had to simply delete a link linking to the content so that it would be harder to find, which at a, at a, at a logical level just strikes me as slightly odd. And it doesn't, to me, make much sense. If, you're, if, you're, if you really think that something should be censored, you should censor it. The idea that you should simply stop somebody pointing to it 
uh, and leave it be is strange. And it, and it suggests a bias more towards lo looking to the technology industry for responsibility rather than the content industry. As I say, I think that's more of a symbol than anything else. There are real questions about dominance of large uh, organizations, um, such as the US technology companies. Um, the European Court of Justice and the European Commission view has tended to be much more than in the US. It's tended to be that size in itself can create harm, uh, that if there is a large dominant company, something ought to be done about it. But some of the history of that attitude within the European Court comes back to the former state-owned monopolies. And there's less of an emphasis on an analysis of economic harm and whether or not the company may be large, but is it actually distorting competition? It, from my point of view, I think that the recent EU competition case against Google is wrong. Uh, or rather, the settlement reached by Almunia uh, with Google strikes me as being fair enough. Uh, and the fact that the case has had to be reopened under lobbying pressure uh, and under pressure within the Commission, I think, is wrong. If you compare that case with the Microsoft case uh, of the past, where Microsoft was disciplined by the EU for bundling, the reality was that if you looked at a, uh, if you had Microsoft software on your computer, it was extremely hard, and and it then bundled its browser and its other software. It was very hard to escape that. It was on the computer in front of you. You couldn't change the operating system. With Google, that's not the case. People are choosing to use Google. They don't have to. Two clicks away is Bing or any other search engine. It's not entrenched in some technological sense, it's just a preference. Um, and it seems to me, therefore, that the EU has to think carefully about this identification of size with abuse. The two aren't necessarily the same thing. I'll also mention in passing some, something that I believe the European initiatives or EU initiatives are, are more sensible than that's taxation which is a subject the, that uh, this country is directly affected by, uh, particularly the double Irish treatment uh, with companies such as Apple and Google of being able to set up uh, either an Irish uh, a registered com a Irish incorporated company but have, a, have an arrangement with an offshore company charging royalties such that the, uh, the tax base is very low or indeed a company that is incorporated in Ireland but not registered in Ireland for tax purposes, a concept I don't really understand. Um, it seems to me that if uh, at some broad level the, the, the social view that a large US companies should pay their fair share of tax is perfectly reasonable. If they, if they want to be over here and take part in the economy, there is no reason why they shouldn't pay uh, standard rates of tax. Um, interestingly, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the sing, what one might call the single Irish, which is competition on straightforward corporation tax, because I think that is broadly accepted, within, certainly within the OECD, as being legitimate. And if Ireland happens to have, or, or has deliberately, a low rate of corporation tax, then fair enough. But I think that the European effort to try to get uh, large US companies to pay more tax, and certainly not to engineer their tax arrangements in some of the ways which Almunia's latest initiatives have suggested uh, is fair. So where does that leave us in terms of the EU's competitive position with uh, U the US in terms of technology and innovation? I would suggest that the EU, from an infrastructure point of view, one of those three categories I mentioned earlier, uh, it's actually not in a bad state. It has a, relatively speaking, in, in many countries, a, an advanced and sophisticated education system. It, it produces a lot of highly educated people. The venture capital base, the financial base, again, it's been weaker than it uh, was in, um, than it is in the uh, US, but it's getting stronger 
there are, there's quite a move, not only of US venture capital companies into London and other centres, but also uh, indigenous venture capital. Um, there is an attitude, certainly in Ireland, certainly in the UK, certainly in the Scandinavian countries, towards encouraging enterprise through taxation, for allowing people who make money and are successful to keep more of the capital gains of that. The one thing I would say about the infrastructure is that Europe suffers from not having the language infrastructure of the US um, uh, in that it doesn't uniformly speak English, or as I think really it would be more appropriately called these days American. Uh, Americans do speak, speak English. Um, the Irish, I'm pleased to say, have been rational enough to keep the English language, uh, even if they decided not to be part of the English Empire. Uh, and uh, that's a competitive advantage. I have, no, I have nothing against Gaelic, but in terms of business opportunity, uh, English is a useful uh, language to speak. And, and, and it's a serious point, because across Europe, um, having different languages makes it much harder to spread a single business. And on the regulation side, I think you can see good things about European regulation. Some of, the, some of the measures I mentioned earlier, and some bad tendencies and some protectionist tendencies which could um, damage the picture in future. And I think not encourage companies to set up, not encourage companies to believe in the possibility of disruption, in the possibility of creating something which, even if it causes incumbents discomfort, will be allowed and encouraged. Um, I think it's very easy for everybody to like the idea of creativity and innovation. They sound like good things, uh, and nobody, I think, would be against them. It's much harder to believe that that goes along with disruption and other people losing. But the reality is that the US economy has done very well out of that combination for a number of years. Other U European economies have done well out of it. And that, broadly speaking, we should think about regulation um, in terms of not protecting, uh, simply protecting instinctively what there is, but thinking rationally about what should uh, come along. And the example I'm going to use finally is, uh, is of Uber, the uh, rather aggressive San Francisco-based uh, taxi, or rather it calls itself sometimes ride-sharing, but it's not ride-sharing. It's really private drivers and limo drivers uh, based on a smartphone app. And I've used Uber in different countries. I've used it in London. I've used it in LA the other day. Um, I used it in Paris. Um, and there's an interesting contrast in the regulatory attitudes towards Uber. In Los Angeles, uh, you can, there's virtually no regulation that I can see. Um, you can turn up and anybody with a car, if you look on the smartphone app, can uh, come and give you a ride. Um, Uber Pop, I think they call it. Um, in Germany, in Berlin, there have been court cases where there are quite intricate regulations which mean that Uber finds it very hard to compete as a minicab company because it doesn't obey the strict regulations which have been placed on what minicabs can do as opposed to taxis. For example, the requirement to return to base between rides if you don't get called in the meantime. Uh, and it strikes me that that's actually the wrong way to go about it. If, if a different category of thing comes along which could be of use to the consumer, but it doesn't happen to fit with historic regulations, that's not a reason to ban it. It's a reason to think very hard about what the first principles of regulation should be. And then finally, I don't want to be too nationalistic about this, but in, in London, the Transport for London has actually decided that Uber should not be unregulated, it should be regulated like a minicab company. So in other words, you have to have a licensed driver, but it can compete openly with taxis. And it, that's upset quite a few of the taxi drivers. But the reality is, I think Transport for London is thinking about the nature of competition and thinking about the way in which the consumer benefit can actually be increased by technology innovation. Um, and it's allowing a degree of upheaval. Uh, and so my final observation is that being in Ireland, a country that's gone through a great deal of upheaval and has, is 
and has been historically open to foreign direct investment, open to the idea of the economy uh, benefiting from flows not only of capital but of intellect, uh, human resources. Uh, Ireland has been pretty successful um, in many of these ways, and if it fiddles with some of the slightly more egregious aspects of its taxation system, I will support it fully. Thank you very much.